Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up... What's next for Turkey's economy after another central bank boss gets fired, sending the value of the lira plummeting? US President Joe Biden's stimulus package sparks a debate about inflation among economists. So how worried should we be about price rises? And forget Hollywood, this year's all about Aussiewood, as productions head down under to escape COVID restrictions. There's been more upheaval at Turkey Central Bank after President Erdogan sacked the third governor in just two years. Naci Agbal was praised by investors for his stewardship at the bank, which included presiding over several interest rate rises. These measures were seen as a key part of restoring confidence in the Turkish lira, which plunged again after news of Agbal's departure. So what does all of this mean for Turkey's economy? Let's bring in Arena Topaseri, who's Senior Emerging Markets Economist at AXA Investment Managers. Arena, thank you for joining us. Why does Naci Agbal's departure matter when it comes to the Turkish Central Bank? The, the arrival of Mr. Agbal, which occurred actually in last November, in November 2020, at the head of the Central Bank, has been pretty important because it brought what we usually refer to in economics to a policy pivot, meaning that uh, he returned the monetary policy towards more an orthodox toolbox, uh, which in turn was supposed to bring in to anchor, if you want, credibly, inflation expectations, which were actually drifting very high in the recent past. So this was an important thing because not only, uh, so he hiked interest rates, uh, a cumulative of 875 basis points, including his last uh, uh, rate hike last week of 200 basis points. And that in turn, uh, through this credibility channel, brought in and brought back a lot of portfolio inflows into the Turkish assets. This is an important thing for Turkey because, as you know, Turkey is a current account deficit country, which means that it has, um, you know, external uh, short-term financing needs. And in turn, these are financed through portfolio inflow. So they need to bring in constant investors' interest back into Turkish assets to be able to finance all that. So for that reason, Akbal has um, has been an important uh, you know, a uh, supporter of that during this period. Unfortunately, the period was much shorter than anyone would have thought. So what do we know then about his replacement? Do we think he's going to take a very different direction? Well, for the time being, the reality is that we don't know that much. Huh? So for the time being, it's a bit of a speculation. So we know um, this new head of the central bank is a university lecturer, so is somebody uh, well-educated. Um, but in turn, we also know that he's been more known as an editorialist. And, and the, the few things that we've read um, from him, which are published in a pro-government uh, newspaper or media outlet, that tells us that he is hailing these kind of rhetoric, which President Erdogan has offered to the markets every once in a while, supporting rather rate cuts, like lower in level of interest rates. So in turn, this would be if it were to be applied, which we don't know as of yet, would, would, would actually constitute a, a pretty big shift in, in monetary policy and therefore has been, at least so far, felt as a negative by financial markets. So President Erdogan has, has argued for a long time against higher interest rates. He says that they cause rather than cure inflation. Why do most economists disagree with that? Well, I mean, because... the. the First of all, economic textbooks show you the opposite. Huh? Usually, uh, when, 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 when a country experiences inflation pressures, you need to hike interest rates to, to tame, in a way, the credit-led spiral. And it's usually what caused, actually, a lot of the inflation stickiness in, in Turkey comes from that reason, because a lot of this domestic demand-driven growth that we've seen in Turkey recently has been credit-fueled uh, growth. So it was a a way that the policy had uh, to to support growth, but in turn, which created inflation. And the only way to anchor credibly those inflation expectations is to cut that credit growth that caused it in the in just to begin with, and that was through the channel of uh, of interest rates. This is the only possibility. So therefore, the it's a counterintuitive phrase that he is uh, he is telling. And obviously, as as soon as he speaks about it, unfortunately. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, financial markets uh, are, are, are wary of what we've actually seen, changes, institutional changes at the head of the 
of the, of the central bank and therefore loss of credibility. So it calls again, the, the, the issue is that it will call for more action from the central bank that it would have been needed because instead of just fighting inflation, you have to fight as well to gain credibility. One of the big side effects of, of this inflation has been the lira being so weak, reaching that record low last year and again plunging after this news. What does that mean for the wider population in Turkey? How does a weak lira affect the rest of the economy? People in Turkey know uh, how much is the interest rate and they talk about it on a monthly basis. So they have an understanding of compound interest rates. They know very, very well how it works, and, and they, they are very wary of the level of the Turkish lira vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, for example. They also know where the gold price is. So these are these all tell you that they became, in a way, financially savvy, if I can say so, because they are aware of these risks on their own budgets, on their own savings, if savings they have, and also on their basket of purchases. And therefore, that triggers kind of behaviors which actually drew a lot of what we call dollarization of the Turkish economy, meaning that the residents, the Turkish residents, have lost faith in, when they lose faith in their currencies, the Turkish lira, they would actually start piling up dollars. So they would sell uh, Turkish lira and buy dollars. So what's the bigger picture then for you with the background of all this financial turmoil? What's in store in your eyes for the Turkish economy in 2021? I would think that the first half of the 2021 year will be on a recessionary path, a contraction of growth, followed by somehow of a some kind of a of, a, of an acceleration of growth into the second half, which will be on the back of first of all the global scenario, the global growth uh, picking up, and of which Turkey benefits as a as a big exporter, and and also as the vaccination unfolds globally, and that should offer. Turkey a better outcome. Now, the first half recession will probably depend a lot on the on the path of the central bank that is going to take in the, in the next few months. OK, and we'll keep an eye on that. Arena Topaseri from uh, AXA Investment Managers, thank you very much for speaking to us. Now, in the United States, the $1.9 trillion economic stimulus package has sparked a heated debate about the risk of inflation there. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers has warned the spending plan could overheat the economy and lead to a huge increase in prices. But the current office holder and former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen disagrees. She says Washington can afford to go big with its stimulus. Kate Moody's here with more on this. Kate, first of all, what sort of inflation are we looking at right now? Well, Stephen, in both the United States and the Eurozone, inflation tumbled during the coronavirus pandemic, bottoming out near zero in the US and negative 0.3% in the euro area. Price rises have since stabilized, hitting 1.7 and 0.9% respectively in the month of February. Keep in mind, both the U.S. Federal Reserve and European Central Bank are targeting around 2% as their ideal level of inflation in the longer term. So what's driving the fear of higher inflation now? Well, the very measures that were brought in to try to boost economic growth during the pandemic have also sparked these concerns. Record low interest rates mean that it's easy to borrow money. Large amounts of fiscal stimulus and pent-up consumer demand mean that households could go on a spending spree once lockdown restrictions are lifted. Meanwhile, the cost of raw materials has risen because of shortages or disruptions during the pandemic. That means that many manufacturers could be poised to boost their prices. The U.S. Federal Reserve argues that any post-pandemic jump in inflation would likely be temporary. Most economists agree the U.S. is at a higher risk of sharp inflation than the eurozone, where the economic recovery is lagging and another recession seems probable. Is inflation always a bad thing? Not at all. In fact, inflation in moderation is actually a sign of a healthy economy. It indicates strong demand and a thriving workforce. But if inflation drastically outpaces wage increases, it can make life too expensive for workers. That's why inflation rates of 15% in Turkey or over 2,000% in Venezuela are so worrying, because the populations are left in poverty. Now, central banks can then raise interest rates in an effort to contain spiraling inflation. Inflation. The U.S. hasn't seen double-digit inflation in decades, even after the financial crisis, but the risk of it looms large, and it plays a crucial role in the balancing act of monetary policymakers. OK, Kate Moody, thank you very much for that. Now, Australia's COVID-free status has brought Hollywood down under. The country has become a prime location for films and TV series being made by some of the world's biggest studios. 
The government there is trying to capitalise on this with hundreds of millions of euros worth of extra grants. Our correspondents Rochelle Harrison and Gregory Pless sent us this report. It's affectionately known as the Hero, a drone that's captured images for films such as Mortal Kombat and Alien Covenant. This company specialising in aerial cinematography is just one of many rapidly growing Australian businesses, thanks to a boom in international productions. They're scrambling to keep up with demand, as filmmakers flock down under to shoot blockbusters and big budget series for the likes of Disney and Netflix. We've had to grow and find uh, more people to service the jobs and we're building plenty of new drones and um, trying to advance the technology. It's a similar story in this Sydney visual effects studio. With the coronavirus pandemic shutting down film and TV productions around the globe, Australia is fast emerging as the new Hollywood, at least for the time being. That's pretty funny, that shot. Yeah. We are seeing a lot of new business requests, like a lot more than we've ever seen in the past. I'd say almost double what we saw in 2019, just in the last six weeks alone. It's like the whole world's film production has pivoted to start filming in Australia, ASAP. The country's COVID-free status, diverse locations and world-class studios have all helped to attract filmmakers. But it's a 260 million euro location incentive grant from the Australian government that's driving the current boom. 11 productions have been announced since July, since that funding was um, first announced. Um, not only that, but of course they're hiring thousands of Australians. The grant scheme is expected to create over 11,000 jobs. The government is hoping its investment will pay off, attracting productions that will lift the industry for years to come, even after the pandemic. That's all from us for this week. But did you know you can find the show as a podcast? Just search for People and Profit in your podcast app. And if you'd like to get in touch with your comments and questions, you'll find me and the team on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.